Well, I invite you now to turn to Psalm chapter 73, Psalm 73, where we will spend our time together this morning. You know, as you're turning there, it's, it's likely that many of you have probably asked or been asked a question this morning along the lines of, did you have a good weekend? You know, it's a common thing that we ask one another. You know, maybe your husband comes home from work. Did you have a good day at work? Your child comes home from school. Did you have a good day at school? You know, typically we evaluate good based on a comparison to our own standards and desires or to the good we perceive others to be enjoying. So did you have a good weekend? Well, did it meet your standard? Were your desires and expectations fulfilled? You might say, yes, I I didn't have to work. I got to watch some college football. It was a good weekend. Or maybe you say, no, I was kind of sick or my child was sick. It didn't meet my standard. So no, it was not a good weekend or Or not really, you know, I saw my neighbor taking their boat out on the lake and I didn't get to do anything fun like that, so it didn't rise to a good weekend. Well, what is good? What is the good that you long for? How do you evaluate what in your life is good? What should constitute a good weekend or a good day at work or at school? Is it simply circumstances that line up with what we expect or desire? No, it's not, and this psalm is going to help us evaluate and hopefully reset our standard of good, but it will do more than that. It's also going to help us think more carefully about God's goodness, because it's a very small step from evaluating the goodness of our life and circumstances to evaluating the goodness of God particularly when we recognize God as the sovereign one over the details of our lives. See, the reality is when you don't think your life is good, you will quickly begin to wonder if God is good. This psalm recognizes that it's very easy to evaluate and doubt God's goodness based on our perspective of our circumstances in comparison to others, which is a slippery slope for us to go down. You see, when you doubt God's goodness, you are very susceptible to temptation and sin. James makes this point in in James chapter 1. He's speaking about sin and temptation. In verse 13, he says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. He says, God doesn't tempt us. We are tempted when we are carried away by our own lusts, which give birth to sin. And he says, part of this, the remedy for this is do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. You see, we are prone to give in to temptation to be deceived about what we want and desire and think we need when we question or do not have confidence in God's goodness. When we think God has withheld something that I need or that would be good for me, we are on the the precipice of sin. We have to have a confidence in God's goodness to battle the temptations that come in our lives. This psalm helps keep us rooted in God's goodness. It keeps us from evaluating and doubting God's goodness based on our circumstances. Now, Psalm 73 is a, a bit of a longer psalm. You'll notice that it's 28 verses, and we're going to cover all of them. Don't, don't tell Tom. Uh, but we're going to work our way efficiently through this entire psalm. It's a psalm of of Asaph, who also wrote Psalm 50 and Psalm 73 to, 7 to 83. He was one of those who, according to 1 Chronicles 6, 32, ministered with song before the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. He was a, a worship leader. 1 Chronicles 6, 39 gives us another interesting fact. He was He-Man's brother, which is pretty cool. Different He-Man than what maybe comes to some of your minds. But um, he, he wrote these psalms 
just as David did, not simply for himself, but to lead the congregation in worship to direct their hearts and minds to the right focus and the right belief. That's a, a part of what happens when we sing. Our minds and our hearts are shaped. And, and so Asaph wrote this song, which was sung by Israel and which we have in our, our Bibles to direct us in that way. It's a similar theme to Psalm 37. It's a a focus on not being envious of evildoers because of the circumstances, or at least our perception of the circumstances of their lives. Psalm 37.1 begins this way, do not fret because of evildoers, be not envious toward wrongdoers. We'll see that same theme in the early verses of this psalm. But Psalm 37 is more of a didactic or teaching psalm. It just tells us, here's how we should think. Here's what we should believe. But Psalm 73 is more of a psalm of testimony. It recounts the psalmist's battle for right thinking and the corresponding right living. But it, it does so in the, in, in the midst of that, it's honest about the wrong thinking of the psalmist. You know, I love that scriptures are honest about the common struggles we experience in those areas. Scripture doesn't just tell us how to think rightly. In wisdom, it leads us from wrong thinking to right thinking. You know, there's a sense in which this psalm could have been five verses. It could have been verse 1 and then verses 25 to 28, which is really the conclusion of how we ought to think. But it includes verses 2 to 16, a testimony of wrong thinking, and 17 to 24, how the Lord moved the psalmist from that wrong thinking to right thinking, which is what God faithfully does for His children. And so this psalm and others like it are really a means God uses to that end. We can read it and identify with and sometimes even agree with the wrong thinking, but then it shifts our perspective and our mindset to where God desires it to be. And so let's consider together this wonderful psalm that leads us away from using our circumstances to evaluate God's goodness and guides us instead to delight in God Himself as our ultimate good. This psalm really begins with the central affirmation that God is good. Notice verse 1, he says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. We're going to see that Asaph has been through a period of doubt, which he will record for us, but which God had brought him through. And so he begins and ultimately will end with the foundational truth that he had almost lost sight of. He says, surely or truly, God is good. This is a consistent theme of Scripture. Psalm 100 verse 5 says, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and His faithfulness to all generations. Multiple times in the Psalms it says, give thanks to the Lord for He is good. Jesus in Luke 18, 19 said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Truly, God is good. All that God is and all that God does is is desirable and worthy of approval. God is good. And God does good to His people. He says, surely God is good to Israel. God's goodness is manifested, it's displayed towards His people. Turn over to Isaiah 63, verse 7. We we see a powerful testimony of God's goodness to Israel. Beginning in verse 7 of Isaiah 63, It says, I shall make mention of the loving kindness of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which He has granted them according to His compassion and according to the abundance of His loving kindness. It says, here's 
God's goodness, his faithfulness towards his people. Verse 8 says, for he said, surely they are my people, sons who will not deal falsely. So he became their savior. In their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his mercy, he redeemed them, and he lifted them and carried them all the days of old. God is good to his people. We see throughout the Old Testament his goodness and faithfulness and care for Israel, chiefly demonstrated in the fact that he is a savior, a redeemer, a rescuer. But the psalmist says it's not so much national Israel that he's thinking of because he goes on and says in, in verse 1, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. He shifts the focus from the nation Israel to the, the true spiritual people of Israel we've learned about in the book of Romans, those who genuinely believe in him, those who are pure in heart. Now, we recognize that if, if this was speaking about those who are pure in heart in and of themselves, there would be none in that category. This is the pure in heart that Jesus described in Matthew 5, 8 when he said, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Not those who are pure in heart in and of themselves, but those who have been made pure in heart by God, those who, verse 3 and 4 of chapter 5 of Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit and those who mourn. This is those who recognize they're not pure in heart, who, who cry out as spiritual beggars mourning over their sin to God for a righteousness that is not their own, and who now long for and, and seek to live out that purity in their life, yes, but who are made pure by Him. The psalmist says, I know that God is good, and God always does good to His own, to His people, to those who are pure in heart. As Psalm 84, 11 says, the, the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does He withhold from those who walk uprightly. That's God. He is good. He does not withhold any good thing from those who are His, from those who are pure in heart. The psalmist affirms this, and yet, verse 2, he says, but as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. He says, I, I know this truth, and yet I almost lost sight of that reality. I almost stopped believing that truth. I almost stopped living like that, or started living like that wasn't true. Boy says of this, this is an example of faith honestly doubting what it does in fact believe. That's an encouragement to know that all who have faith will at times honestly doubt what they do in fact believe. You, if you're in Christ, you, you've experienced this, you know what is true, you believe what is true, but there are seasons of doubt where you can say like the psalmist, I, I almost slipped. The, the comfort is that we won't slip. Verse 23 tells us why the psalmist did not slip. And it's this, it's that I am continually with you. You, Lord, have taken hold of my right hand. Why did the psalmist not slip? Because God was holding his hand. And God directed him back to the truth. Why had he come close to stumbling. Why had he almost slipped? Well, verse 3 says, he was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. This brings us to a, a, a second aspect that we see in this psalm, the common distraction, the envy of the wicked. You see, the psalmist believed that central affirmation that God is good, but he was distracted from that truth, and he began to doubt that truth as he was envious of the wicked. You know, that picture of, of feet stumbling or steps slipping is, is related to the common 
biblical imagery of, of life as a path that we walk on. And he says, I almost got off of that path. I almost stumbled off of that path because I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You know, this is easy for those who are God's people to, to go down this road, which is why it's a frequent warning in Scripture. I already mentioned Psalm 37, one, don't fret because of evildoers, do not, or be not envious toward wrongdoers. Proverbs 23, 17 also says, do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. Proverbs 24, 19 says, do not fret because of evildoers, or be envious of the wicked. You see, we can easily be distracted from or begin to doubt the goodness of God when we become envious of the prosperity of the wicked. Now, it's not just the wicked that we are not to be envious of. As you know, the scriptures elsewhere speak that we are not to be jealous or envious of any, so don't envy the godly either. But the focus of this psalm is, is particularly on the envy that flows from that theological conundrum that is common among God's people. Why do the wicked seem to thrive and the godly seem to suffer in this life? That's what Asaph was experiencing. He said, I know God is good, and yet I look out and I see the wicked seemingly thriving and the godly seemingly suffer, and so I'm, I'm wondering what is going on. What was it that he saw? Look at at verse 4, he looked out and saw, verse 4, that there are no pains in their death and their body is fat. He says they, not that they don't physically suffer when they die, but they have no distress or troubles on their mind as they approach death. Their body is fat in a, in a good way. They have all that they need and all that they desire. They are at ease. Verse 5, he says, they are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. He says, they, they don't face the difficulties and the trials that seem to come to the godly. They don't, they don't experience the trouble and the heartache that is, is a consistent part of so many others' lives. Now, it's interesting to me that this perspective is not accurate, <laughs> It's not true that categorically all wicked people have easy lives and never experience pain and trouble. In fact, they do. But when we get focused on comparing ourselves to others, we tend to overestimate how great others have it, and we tend to minimize the blessings of our own lives. And that's part of what the psalmist is doing here. He says they, they have no pain, they have all that they need, they have no trouble, Therefore, verse 6, pride is their necklace. They can boast about how great their life is. And the garment of violence covers them. They, they can experience all of these things even at the cost of others by doing violence against them. He says their eye bulges from fatness and the imaginations of their heart run riot. They, they have everything they want and more. There's nothing that they dream of wanting that they are not satisfied with. And he says, the wicked experience this, at least I perceive that they experience this, in spite of the fact that verse 8 says, they mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They, they mock God, they oppress God's people he says, they speak from on high, they have set their mouth against the heavens, they blaspheme God, their tongue parades throughout the earth, they, they do not honor God, they do not obey God, they do not care for God's people, they speak against Him. Therefore, verse 10 says, His people return to this place and waters of abundance are drunk by them. This is the, probably the most complicated verse in in the psalm to understand what he's speaking of. Commentators are divided even on whether he's talking about the wicked here or the godly. He, he may be speaking of how the godly see the wicked and are drawn into their temptation or how the wicked are oppressing the godly uh, in those ways. 
And they say, how does God know? Is there knowledge with the Most High? Again, the wicked may be speaking there that they're the ones saying God doesn't know or care. We live how we want. Or maybe the godly who see this issue of the wicked thriving and say, does God not know or, or does God not care? He concludes the section, verse 12, behold, these are the wicked, and always at ease they have increased their wealth. That's his perspective. The wicked, their life is great. <laughs> They're always at ease, at comfort, and they have wealth. See, Asaph looked out and he, he saw the wicked and, and his focus was on them. Notice in this section from verse uh, 2 there down through verse 12, how often you see the pronouns they and them and their. Over ten times we see Asaph focused on them. This, this is always to be a little warning light in our mind and hearts, when we are focused on others and the circumstances of their lives, that's never going to end well for us. What should he have been focused on? Well, we'll see it in a bit. I think you probably know the right answer already. He should have been focused on God, but he was consumed with the circumstances of others. Because it's so easy to focus on others instead of on Him. And in this case and, and in ours, it's easy to focus on the prosperity of the wicked in a way that almost causes us to stumble, to doubt the goodness of God to the pure in heart. Now, can you relate to this? Do you ever feel that way? You know, maybe questions like, why does the, the guy at work who, who lacks integrity, who's not kind to others? Why is he the one who got the promotion or the opportunity? Why does that extended family member who ignores God get to enjoy so much financial success and, and all that goes with that? Why are the popular kids at school primarily the ones who are consumed with themselves? Why are the majority of the world's rich and famous so godless? Why are the wicked at ease? See this focus on others, and, and particularly on the prosperity of the wicked, led him to a dangerous and flawed conclusion. Third, we see the contorted conclusion. He, he says, is it vain to keep my heart pure? Notice verse 13, as he focused on the wicked, he says, surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence for I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. You see, his focus was on them, and now he compares them to me. You see all the eyes in that section. He's looking at his life in comparison to their life, and he's saying, it doesn't seem like a great deal to keep my heart pure. He says, what's the point of following God when the result is being stricken all day long and chastened every morning while the wicked are always at ease? Again, this is not an accurate assessment. Comparisons rarely are. You know, you may see all the trouble and trials or, or not see all the trouble and trials of others on their Facebook posts or other things, but it's not as simple as their life's perfect and my life's not. But what a sobering place for Asaph to be, to be genuinely asking the question, has it been a waste to obey the Lord? Well, the psalmist recognized this, this sobering place that he was. We see that in verse 15. He says, if I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. He kind of catches himself and is like, whoa, I shouldn't say what I'm thinking out loud. I, 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 if I speak this way, I would be betraying the generations of your children, Lord. I can't express these doubts. Boyce writes of this, he says, having doubts like Asaph's, is not incompatible with responsible Christian living. 
It may have been true, as he says, that his feet had almost slipped, but they had not actually slipped, or at least they had not slipped so far as to make him forget his responsibilities as a leader of God's people. See, Asaph was wrestling with these things, but he was still careful about what he said and to whom he said it. When you're wrestling and struggling with doubt, when you have questions of the Lord, be careful what you say or what you post. Be, be mindful of the influence those things can have on others. It's interesting, though, that he wrote a psalm about it. It's like, wait a minute, I, I, if I speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of children. Well, if he only said verse 3 through uh, verse 14, yes. But he records these for us in a way that magnifies the truth and helps unmask the similar folly in our own hearts. He speaks of it in an appropriate way in this psalm to direct us to the truth. But nonetheless, verse 16 says, he says, when I pondered to understand this, when I considered all these things, it was troublesome in my sight. I kept thinking about the goodness of God that I believe, but the circumstances of life that I'm witnessing, and it is troublesome to me. I can't figure it out. I can't put it all together. You see, while Asaph believed the central affirmation that God is good, he experienced a common distraction, that of being envious of the circumstances of the wicked, which tempted him toward a contorted or flawed conclusion that it was vain for him to keep his heart pure. But thankfully, the Lord brought him forthly to the clarifying perception towards a renewed focus on God and on eternity. He says, this was true of me, verse 17, until, until I came into the sanctuary of God. This is the hinge of, of the psalm where he, he begins to move from wrong thinking, from envy of the wicked to right thinking. And he says, that happened when I came into the sanctuary of God. You know, sanctuary means holy place and there's some debate about what, what exactly he's referring to that he came into the sanctuary. I think it's probably just that. It's referred to, it's referring to the tabernacle and other places that he came to worship the Lord. You know, and I think the key idea is that it was the sanctuary of God. He came to focus no longer simply on them and on me, but he got his eyes off of those things back onto the Lord and his holiness. You know, we don't have a sanctuary. Some of you may have grown up in churches like I did where we called it a sanctuary, and that was like a motivation not to run and things because it's a holy place. Uh, but this is a worship center. It's a room that we get together in. It's not a holy location, but it's where we gather to corporately worship. And when we gather to corporately worship, we are reminded of God. It gets our eyes off of the them that we can be consumed with and off of me, and it puts them on him, on you. One writer puts it this way. He says, worship puts God at the center of our vision. It is vitally important because it is only when God is at the center of our vision that we see things as they really are. That's what happened for Asaph. He came to the sanctuary of God and his reality was cleared up. He, he was able to see things as they really are. He had a restored focus on God, and, and it says in verse 17, and also then he, I perceived their end. He was reminded that this life is not all there is, that there is an eternity, an eternity for the wicked that is not free of pain and trouble as this life may sometimes appear. He describes that end in verse, beginning in verse 18. He says, surely, truly, you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. He says, I almost slipped. 
I almost slid down that slippery slope of envy, but the reality is the wicked are the ones on the slippery slope sliding toward destruction. He says, you cast them down to destruction, a destruction that he says will be swift and terrible. Verse 19, how they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors, like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. He says at some point, the wicked will wake up from their dream, and the mirage of wickedness bringing bliss, it will instantly fade, And they will be faced with reality, and the reality is of God's swift, righteous judgment. You see, Asaph came to understand that there is an eternity in which God will right the perceived wrongs of this life. God's swift and righteous judgment against the wicked. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 describes this judgment Beginning in verse 7, it says, The Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Because that's reality. That's the fate that awaits the wicked. It's the fate that we deserved apart from Christ, but it's what everyone who rejects God, who lives for themselves, who does not obey the gospel, will face. You know, some of you here today are probably not like Asaph, battling to think rightly about God and to keep your heart and life pure. Some of you are the wicked that Asaph was envious of. You're content in your wickedness. You have bought the lie that the path to a good life is one which ignores and opposes God. I urge you to repent and run to Christ in faith, to obey the gospel as 2 Thessalonians 1 said, not to obey, to earn salvation, but to respond as God commands in the gospel by repenting and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, by trusting in his perfect life and his substitutionary death and his glorious resurrection as the only way you can escape the coming judgment of God. Asaph says that is what reality is. He came into the sanctuary of God, and he got a wake-up call, a clarifying perception. He perceived God in his greatness and his holiness and his grace, and he perceived the end of the wicked. You know, that's what we so often need, and, and one of the things that we find in worship, whether that's corporately or individually, We are reminded of the greatness and holiness of God, of His work on our behalf through His Son, that the only reason we are spared judgment is because of God's grace in Christ. We're reminded of eternity past and of the eternity yet to come, and this gives us perspective that we need, perspective that it's easy to lose. Well, the reason for this mindset shift in Asaph was not that, that he was just a smart guy who kind of finally figured it all out. It was rather, fifthly, God's continued correction of him, the fact that he wouldn't let him go, that he won't let us go. Asaph recounts in verses 21 to 24 in summary form what had gone on in his heart and life and how God brought him out of that. Notice verse 21, he says, when my heart was embittered and I was pierced within. He says, when I focused on them and all that they had and how they were prospering at ease and I compared them to me and the circumstances of my life, I was embittered. My heart was bitter. He was angry, frustrated at God that he would allow my circumstances to be as they are when others who hate him are prospering. 
He says, I was, I was pierced, I was pained within me. And, and the result, verse 22, is then I was senseless or foolish or stupid and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. You realize that when bitterness and envy are, are rooted in our hearts, when we tolerate those things towards God, it leads us to be to be foolish and ignorant in how we think about life and and how we live. We're like a beast that just is lumbering about destroying things in our world. Asaph says, that was me. I, I lost my focus, and it led me to be bitter towards you, Lord, in a foolish and ignorant way. And yet, God didn't let him stay there. Look at verse 23. He says, nevertheless, I am continually with you. Even though I was foolish and ignorant and like a beast before you, you were still with me. I'm with you. I'm continually with you. And you have taken hold of my right hand. He says, Lord, you kept me from stumbling You took hold of my hand and you brought me back to trust in you and your character in your word. You you righted my focus back where it needed to be. And he says, you're going to keep doing that. I know you will continue that. Verse 24, he says, with your counsel, you will guide me. He says, "In, in the past, I look back and I see how you have taken my hand. You brought me out of this bitterness. And in the future, I know that you will continue to guide me. You will guide me through the counsel of your word to keep me grounded and rooted in your truth. And you will do so until afterward you receive me to glory. What an encouraging reality to know that God will finish what he began. We sang about that today and and read about that earlier, that God is committed to finish the work that He has started. Philippians 1.6, for I am confident of this very thing, that He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. If you are one of God's children, if you are genuinely a believer who is in Christ, there will be seasons when you doubt There will be times when you say, I almost stumbled, I almost slipped, my focus got off, and yet God is going to continue that work in you. He will not let you go. I love Psalm 121. It says, where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not stumble. And he goes on and says, the Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. That's what God's going to do. Doesn't mean that we sit idly by on our couch and we just let God do that work in us. He's given us means to that end. One of those means is His Word, the the psalm that we are reading today and others like it that help get our focus back, that God counsels us and guides us through His Word that is honest about our struggles and yet directs us to think and respond rightly. We need to run to that. One of those means is, is His church. It's the gathering together for worship that we need to come to the sanctuary of God to have our perspective refocused on Him, on His character, on eternity, on the judgments that comes and the, and the grace that we have received. It is through those things that God will continue to guide us and counsel us and until He receives us in glory. The psalmist recognized this is not about me finding my way. This is God guiding me and bringing me to glory, which leads lastly to the psalmist's confident assertion, the psalmist's confident assertion that God is my good. Notice verse 25 He says, whom have I in heaven but you, and besides you 
I desire nothing on earth. One commentator put it this way. He says, the psalmist comes to rest in what God is to him, however unpromising his situation. You see, early in this psalm, if you ask the psalmist, what do you desire? He would have listed things like no pains in my death, no trouble, not being plagued, having all the stuff that I want, all these things that I want that I see other people having. Now what does the psalmist say? He says, besides you, I desire nothing on earth. He says, I see the wicked, they think they have it good, and at times I'm tempted to think they have it good too. But the reality is, I have all I desire, and it is God. As if you are in Christ, again, that's the cry of our heart. It's not always the reality of our thinking. We get distracted by so many other things that we think, oh, if only I had that, only got to experience that, if only this was true in my life. He says, no, whom have I in heaven but you, and beside you I desire nothing on earth. He continues, verse 26, my flesh and my heart may fail, my my physical body will fail, not simply in, in doubt and stumbling, but in death ultimately. But he says, God is the strength of my heart. God will keep my inner man enduring to the end. And he says, and God is my portion forever. He says, my life on this earth will come to an end, just like the wicked And yet for the wicked, all they have, all that they have enjoyed in this life will come to an end at the same time. For those of us who are God's people, our life will come to an end, but not so for us. The Lord is our portion forever. Makes me think of Numbers chapter 18, verse 20, when the the Lord was speaking to Aaron, and Aaron was high priest, and, and he said this to him, you shall have no inheritance in their land, nor own any portion among them. He said, you're, you're priest, and so you don't get a piece of land for your inheritance. You don't get property ownership of the land of promise that I have given you. He says, instead, I am your portion and your inheritance among the sons of Israel. I think if we're honest about our own hearts, many of us or much of the time would be tempted to say, man, that's kind of a raw deal. No land, you know, no no tangible inheritance that you were given, only God. Asaph says, no. What a deal. You got God. There's nothing else that you need or desire. He is your portion forever. You see, the psalmist Asaph went from that theological conviction of verse 1 that surely God is good to Israel to the conclusion that not only is God good, but God is my highest good. And he expresses that in summary in verse 27 and 28 when he says, For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. That's what he came to perceive. They're going to perish. They're going to face destruction. All those who are wicked and unfaithful, that's what their future holds. But he says, as for me, the nearness of God is my good. You see, not only is God himself good, but God is himself my highest good. When you are tempted to think that the wicked one's life without God seems greater than your life with God, that is a foolish and ignorant perspective for us to have. 
There is no greater good than the nearness of God that we can experience because of the sacrifice of Christ. There is no comparison to a life and eternity in right relationship with Him. He says, the nearness of God is my good. How can you tell if you are thinking that way? If the nearness of God truly is the highest good in your mind and life. Notice how he concludes verse 28. He gives two realities that demonstrate this fact that for him, the nearness of God is his good, that he has come to recognize that. The first, he says, I have made the Lord God my refuge. You are living in a way that shows that that you understand God is your highest good when you run to Him and depend on Him in the midst of any difficulty and trial that you face. When you understand God is my highest good, you will run to Him in the midst of whatever it is that you face. You know, it's so easy to run to other things to seek refuge in other things or other people. You know, for some that may be substances, running to those to to just escape the reality of what they're facing. Maybe you're tempted to run to other people in your life who you think can, can fix the issues and the circumstances that you face or to your financial resources or to any other thing. He says, no, all I need and all I have is God, and He alone is my refuge. You can tell you're thinking this way, that God is your highest good when you make God your refuge, and secondly, when you tell of His works. He says, as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. It's interesting. I think that's That's part of what Asaph is doing in this psalm. He is telling of God's work, God's work in his own heart, how he was close to stumbling, and yet God guided him back, holding his right hand, keeping him from stumbling, bringing his focus back to where it needed to be, bringing him back to a content satisfaction and delight in God himself. You know, we talk about the things we desire. We talk about the things we think are good. We should talk about God, our highest good, and and the hope that we have through His Son. So, beloved, like Asaph, you and I can focus on what others have that we don't. We can focus on the ease of others in contrast with the troubles of our lives. We can focus on that perplexing reality that at times the the wicked seem to temporarily prosper, which really is just a a reminder of God's grace to them and, and His grace that we have received that He's lavished on us in a far greater way. And if we go down that road as a consistent pattern, we will be bitter, we will be tempted to doubt God's goodness to question whether it's worth it to follow Him, we will give in to all sorts of sin and temptation in our life. Or we can focus on God and the amazing reality that in Christ we experience the nearness of God both in this life and forevermore. And we can say with the psalmist, whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you I desire nothing on earth. And but as for me, the nearness of God is my good. So don't use your circumstances in comparison to others to evaluate God's goodness. Instead, delight in God Himself as your ultimate good. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your faithfulness to us and the fact that You use Your Word and Your people to to refocus us, 
to keep our hearts and our minds fixed on You. We pray that that would be the case for us even today, that as we have come to to worship You, to see You for who You are, and to be reminded of eternity and the judgment that awaits, Lord, that we would have a a renewed confidence in, in Your goodness and grace to us, and that we would have a renewed zeal to keep our hearts pure and clean, and a, a renewed commitment and contentment in You alone. Lord, don't let us be envious of others. Don't let us look at the, the ease and comfort that we perceive others to enjoy and ever doubt Your goodness to us. Lord, may You truly be our highest good, and may we live in a way that clearly demonstrates that to a watching world who is desperate to find goodness in so many other ways. Lord, we thank You for our time together today, and we entrust the rest of our day to You. In Christ's name, amen.